Good evening, everybody. I'm going to keep it short because the introduction has been long. All protocol observed is a, a favorite South African saying, but I'm really honored by uh, both the distinguished guests uh, in gowns and distinguished guests from elsewhere in the world who are with us and elsewhere in the country um, who are not wearing gowns, but uh, and uh, likewise, the members of my family, yet the younger ones. But uh, there will be more about you later in this lecture. I will allow myself to speak a little bit more about myself, but in a context of my research, and then go on to the global challenges which form the last two words of my title. You know, uh, or I, I, I certainly know from the looks I get that this is an unusual surname. And um, I often get asked about it, and I'm not going to give you a lecture on the uh, Prussian military nobility, nor about where the bloch in that part comes from. But if you are interested, we do know. <laughs> One of the interesting bits about life at the university is that uh, you get to listen to other academics who are really clever. And in the early part of my career, we had a great tradition in chemical engineering to invite the cleverest and the uh, most quirkiest of professors to come and speak. And uh, the one that uh, made a lasting impression was George Ellis, who was uh, you know, a, a really global star in the field of cosmology. But he spoke about complexity and how the different disciplines that we have at the university relate to each other. Um, and, uh, in that lecture, he made a point uh, around the social world that your mother really matters much more than your father and who you are. And so I decided to just throw in a little bit about my maternal line in the back, background, who are not represented, of course, in the, in the naming. And this is my maternal grandmother, um, who was born a countess, uh, but in poverty. And uh, that certainly shaped her in, in a particular way. Uh, I think that they had well-off family and they got a little house at the edge of the forest uh, where they could grow up. She did what grandmothers in Africa also do. She raised a child who had lost her parents, um, who was not her granddaughter directly, but is my cousin. Uh, and if that one looks like a politician, it is because she is. She became a member of the German parliament for the Green Party. and. Uh, I guess I have to take a step back about why I mention her, because as you know, I, I was born in, uh, I wasn't born, I, I grew up in Swakopmund where uranium mining is really important. And as I got impressed by how clever people are to take uranium out of ore and make a fuel of it, my cousin grew up in parallel five kilometers away from the place where the radioactive waste was going to be buried, and she grew up in the green resistance to that idea. And so, you know, that gave me an intuitive in introduction to a field called life cycle thinking, which is quite central to my work. Um, that, uh, yeah, you know, just that, that realization that whilst jobs in my town depended on this industry, uh, and there was great science and engineering involved in it, it caused real big conflict in my cousin's little village. She went to parliament with Joschka Fischer, and voted out nuclear power in Germany. Finally, my first name. It doesn't have a W. It's not the British school. Um, it's more like Harry. It's the Herald. And my grandmother here had a twin brother by that name. She named her first son, my, my mum's brother by that name. And. Uh, he had an accident at the age of two. He got uh, boiling water poured over him. He died. And this is quite relevant to current day South Africa, where these statistics um, are things that we as engineers also need to confront. This comes from the Hel um, Household Energy Safety Association of South Africa. And so I feel a certain connection through my first name to the plight of, uh, of people who have to, to make do and with very different, difficult circumstances. Right, but that, um, that is what we call a safety moment in engineering. We have some quirky or, or 
we have a culture in engineering where public safety is really, really important. And we try to instill that in our young uh, students. Um, quite early on, they have to give a little one minute talk on safety. Uh, and uh, so here I just wanted to bring a public safety moment in early on in my talk to also illustrate that these are matters that we need to pay attention to. If you think this talk's all about myself, it's not. Um, my scholarship is largely determined by the people whom I've had the pleasure to work with, and here are some of them. Just checking my timing. On to the global challenges. This audience probably need, needs no introduction to the range of global challenges there are. This is a popular representation of a piece of work that was published in Nature about three years ago. Our DVC for Climate and Development spoke about that at his inaugural lecture a short while ago. I don't want to speak about these in the same way. I want to rather ask the children, uh, my children who've come to introduce one of the global challenges that we have by just coming forward and showing me what they found on the beach recently. Right, or rather, if you want to pass those up, okay, the rows, and you can bring that that side, and if somebody wants to take this to the other side and pass them around, my win, <laughs> thank you. Right, and of course, the global challenge that, uh, that we see when we go and walk on the beach increasingly is that of plastic pollution. I was gonna go and look up some facts about it, and I realized that all of you probably have been exposed to this and can look it up yourself, so I'm not gonna lose any sleep over that. The reason behind that is, of course, that plastics are very much in demand, and this is a long-term uh, graph of, of global plastics production, and you can see that it is growing very, very fast. And when you don't manage the plastic at the end of the life, then some of it will end up in the oceans, and that increasingly so. The second global challenge that I want to speak to very briefly is that of resource extraction. That is, limit, uh, that is mirrored by the previous graph. This is a 1900 to 2000 graph. It shows the major categories of resources that humanity depend on. This is important for chemical engineers. The green is biomass. The blue is um, construction minerals. The red, fossil energy carriers. And the yellow, ores and industrial minerals. What is somewhat encouraging is that our wealth in the black line grows faster than our use of materials. So we decouple, to some extent, our wealth from our extraction of minerals, but only to some extent. Overall, there's, there's the question of, are there limits to how much we can take from the planet? This is a global challenge. And it's compounded by the fact that whilst demand increases, and not linearly, but exponentially, actually, the capacity for production is being impacted by bad management of those very um, parts of nature that provide the resources. Thirdly, an introduction to global challenges is incomplete without a mention of climate change. And this is a very famous moment from Al Gore's movie, which uh, you can probably recall, where he gets onto the elevator to show how high the graph will go. If I should very briefly speak to it, it shows the last 400,000 years of Earth's climate history in terms of temperature and carbon dioxide and how they mimic each other and how in just the very last 200 years, the red, which represents temperature, has gone double what it, you know, it's gone a lot higher. Uh, sorry, the, the red, which is carbon dioxide, um, and is projected in our lifetime to shoot off the charts. And um, interestingly, Al Gore made a plea that this would be immoral if we allowed this to happen. And that was a turning point in my career because suddenly the stuff that I do at the university started to interest a whole lot of people. However, it hasn't helped with emissions at all. Um, this graph here that was published this year by the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, shows how emissions have continued to rise. And, uh, not only have they continued to rise, they've grown faster than ever before, whilst we already know that we should try to reduce them. So 
we have some real problems and this seems to call for action. In this country, when we want to go and have some action, we put on overalls. So I brought mine. <laughs> Vice Chancellor, would it be okay if I lectured in a green overall? He's nodding. <laughs> All right. I bought this with the intent to wear it and then I woke up this morning to realize, no, no, at the university, we think before we take action. <laughs> so, this is the theory part of my lecture, I'm afraid. There will be about 10 slides that get a little bit theoretical and then we can come to the action. We write a lot at university and I'm not going to ask you to read all of this that I recently wrote in a research report to the Water Research Commission. Um, but uh, the last sentence maybe is what's important here. We are trying to address two different imperatives simultaneously with limited resources, and if we can do that, then we are doing well as modern engineers. And that is, we simultaneously need to get those curves to bend down and to look after all those who are still needing basic services. Around people in poverty and basic services, there is progress. The United Nations Development Program came out with its annual Human Development Report recently with quite an upbeat message. The rise of the globe of the South and the graph that is shown here just shows Sub-Saharan Africa's GDP um, per capita. So how much money each Sub-Saharan African is, uh, is earning on average doesn't show that there may be distortions and inequalities, but the graph is clearly on the app. Africa rising is a theme that many of you will have heard about. So in some ways, the prospects for the current generation are improving, but we have to ask ourselves, what about the prospects for our children and grandchildren? If we're facing a four degree temperature rise, or rather if they are facing a four degree temperature rise, that may undo a lot of the progress. So sustainable development is what we call the light motif of my work. And uh, you know, it, it centrally resolves the confrontational uh, discourse that used to exist between development and environment. We can't develop because we need to protect the environment. This is not the way we talk about these matters. We try to find ways to develop that give our future generations an even chance as well. And this has been politically agreed to in, in a number of global uh, summits. Uh, and uh, we understand also that there are three spheres involved and that they embedded one in the other. And uh, that's just a bit of theory that I, I think is enough on sustainable development. The engineer in this space has a hard task, and this is a slide I share with my fourth year class, that uh, we really want to maximize the benefit from activities that engineers do for society, whilst at the same time minimizing the risk. And that is to all sorts of people, the workers, the neighbors, the clients, and also future generations. Another little definition of engineering that I quite like that's in the textbook of our first years is that engineering is doing well with one brand that any bungler can do with two after some sort of fashion. It's uh, from the United States, over a hundred years old quote. Um, but I think that's still a nice uh, definition about how we maybe distinguish ourselves as engineers. Where do chemical engineers, the discipline that I work with, fit into our industrial society? This is a sort of old-fashioned way of looking at the industrial society uh, that makes products for use and then throws them away. We fit in very squarely into the second block of manufacture, and uh, we extract materials and we beneficiate materials so that others can make the products that you and I use. We're really good at two things. Um, sorry to my colleagues, you're good at a lot of other things too. But um, we're really good at accounting for materials because you know, we, we take them out of the resources that fishermen and foresters and miners have taken from the earth and we hand them over to uh, 
others to make goodies and the accountants watch us closely, but they rely on us actually doing the physical accounting. And because when you beneficiate a material, you make it a higher quality, you usually have to put energy into it, and that is costly. We're also historically very good at accounting for energy. And so just keep those two in mind because they'll come back. I now turn from chemical engineering, I'm still in the theory part, to um, the planet and nature, and just a few definitions uh, about how we understand nature these days, because it's always a university thing to define well what you mean when you speak. Um, I will use the term ecosphere repeatedly, uh, when I, and, and that's about the same as nature, and it includes um, all the living things, the biosphere, plus the places in which it lives, which is the air, the water, and the soil. Interestingly, nature, the ecosphere is governed by the same physical laws that we use when we account for materials and energy in our chemical process plants, and so that gives me a very interesting basis to do my analyses from how our engineering affects nature. The same laws apply. And essentially these three are the ones that, that matter to us. I want to introduce very briefly the idea of a structure that can maintain its internal order over time. That fancy word is dissipative structures. It won a Nobel Prize uh, for Ilya Prigogine uh, many, many years ago. Um, and all our bio biological systems are such systems, um, whether they're single cells, organisms, individuals. But increasingly, uh, we also think that social systems behave in the same way, that in order to increase, maintain their internal order um, and uh, to improve, increase the amount of information they hold over time, they, uh, need, they need to feed and they need to export wastes. Social systems often do that only around energy and not materials, but um, what I learned from that is that at the level of the individual, waste is a law of nature. It is inevitable, and I'm not a great fan of the term zero waste that uh, some of my friends in the civil society movements, environmental movements, often like to use. But they might have a point. The question then arises how the planet copes with all these individuals that need to feed and waste. And fortunately, the planet is endowed with this very large flow of energy that comes in from the sun. Same amount of energy leaves, but this is the beauty of the second law. As that energy gets transformed from a high potential energy to a low potential energy, it does a lot of useful work on the planet. It powers both the local cycles of material and energy and ecosystems and the global cycles. And at this stage, um, I want to acknowledge one of my gurus, um, Tim Jackson, who's the photo on the bottom right of that photo gallery. I don't think I've ever met him, but I've read a large number of his pieces. This was one of his early ones. We can do mass and energy balances on this planetary system, and in my first years get this textbook question. I didn't invent it, but uh, it's in a textbook of ours to ask how much of the solar energy striking the Earth's surface is needed to drive the water cycle, water going up and raining down. And it turns out to be just under half of the solar energy does nothing but make sure that you and I get fresh water when it rains. So I'm almost through the theory. So we have that good powerful radiation coming in. It's not that good if it strikes your skin. Um, same amount of energy leaves, and the system is closed in that it exchanges all, almost no matter with space. I'm not going to argue with an um, astrophysicist on that point. Um, we can call it a giant heat engine that does useful work. And one, one can say that over the millennia, as the planet evolved, it is this giant heat engine that has driven this ever-increasing complexity in living systems and the amount of information they hold. And so in the last 200 years, we've run this thing rather the other way around, in that we've started to take fat from within the system and burn it and not excrete 
some of the nasty heavy metals that are in the fat and they accumulate in the body of the planet. Can we mimic these natural cycles? A question that gets asked. And yes, we can almost do that. Here's an example of sea salt. You can take a quick look. NaCl to the right there is uh, just your table salt. We make two important chemicals from that by sticking electrical in, in energy into an industry called the chloralkali industry. After industrial use, these recombine and the effluents go down the rivers to the oceans and we can harvest that salt again. We can have a cycle going around and we can imagine that cycle to be running just on the energy from the sun if we can supplement that electric energy with photovoltaic harvested energy. So we should be able to look after 9 billion people uh, if we learn a little bit from nature. Such a system, however, would require a lot of joined up action. No one in this chain can afford, can afford to let something fall through the cracks. Right, at this stage I'm coming back to those lids that were found on the beach. That's where they fall through the cracks. And that's just around the corner from my home in Woodstock. Okay, so somewhere we're not getting things right yet. Okay, so that's my theory, that's what I profess, that's what I teach. Materials should be kept in cycles, the cycles should be powered by renewable energy, but also the cracks, joined up action requires something we call systems intelligence. We know what we need to do, we've known that for a while, but how are we doing? The second part of my lecture goes to this question on how are we doing against these three points. Um, and now that I've done the theory, I'm going to ask again whether I may turn to action. I may turn to action now that I have thought. Right. Um, I, I can't quite do this by myself. Melissa, one of my postgrads, Melissa, can you come and help me with a gear change, please? Um, whilst Melissa helps me here, can you, if you've switched off your phone, you're just so good. If you haven't, you're welcome to use it in the meantime. I have a question for you. Right, so you need to open a browser, go to q.na, type in that code when it prompts you and answer my question. Right, you're going to put this on. I'm putting it on. Right, you know, try that. Oh, that... that. Those aren't safety boots. No, not at all. <laughs> we're, going to ask, we're going to ask him a bit. This will take a moment in terms of uh, people answering my question. that will fit on. Highly unlikely. Highly unlikely. There we go. Right. No, 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 no. Not yet, not yet. So, you know, we, uh, Melissa got a letter this morning. Uh, came from the Minister of Higher Education of Germany. And she has been uh, selected as one of 25 young people from across the world as green talents to go to Germany and uh, with 25 other young green leaders from across the world, find out how far they've gone um, and hopefully also show them how far we've gone. So I want you to now clap because... <laughs> well done. Nice. You see the professor has the duty to teach and to do research and if some of you come and you 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 asking why we're not joining your actions, um, we may be sympathetic, but uh, it's for you out there to do the actions based on the knowledge that we seek. Okay, I, I 
in terms of the green stuff there, let's see how you're doing. Um, I can now go to my browser. 73 of you have done this. Wow. Uh, that needs another round of applause. <laughs> All right, there you are. How green is this audience? Okay, sure. Um, right, about a quarter of you are still either in a situation where this is not provided to you. And uh, I'm looking at a colleague from the city of Cape Town who knows how, just how difficult it is to provide the infrastructure uh, that, that your recyclables can be taken away. Um, and we've, we've been writing about that difficulty. Thanks for being here. Um, so water heaters, of course, a lot of capital investment, but one out of seven of this audience, that's that's stunning. Well done. This is really, in, in fact, one out of seven only do the solar water heater, I think. Uh, although I must tell you up the numbers, you are allowed to answer more than one. So this is, of course, not a perfectly good uh, survey. Um, the point here being is that we're starting to use this technology in class. Um, and this question is uh, you know, just a little survey question, but we can ask targeted questions to our students in class, and we're making use of the great um, IT facilities that the university is investing in. My first year students all have a laptop um, and they can all do uh, work on the Wi-Fi in class. So we are doing well on that front. Let me move on. We're through the theory, we're into the action. Let me find my slides again and resume. How are we doing? with recycling. So now I'm going through the first three parts of my words of my title. Recycling, renewables, systems intelligence. Quite quick, just a bit of an update. Many of you will know better, but this is a chance to get it from the professor who's been <laughs> trying to keep his eye on the, uh, on the action. Of course, recycling is about cutting out the environmentally damaging steps of raw material extraction and final disposal. Do South Africans recycle? Well, your own response indicated that you do, and in some material classes we're doing pretty well. We're doing pretty well. Um, for some, not so well. You can see plastics down there. It's a difficult material to recycle, and the challenge of ocean pollution and the difficulty recycling says to us that we probably need another horse than recycling to solve that particular one. Metals have always been recycled well, they're very valuable. Tires, wow. Okay, so it does take time. You know, this doesn't happen overnight, this question of infrastructure, aligning the systems and so on. So here's a little graph. Um, this is uh, the pa plastic bottle. If you take water in plastic bottles um, or Coca-Cola, there's an enormous number of those that go around the country. I think I've done the numbers right. It's just unbelievable. Um, but the recycling rate is on the app over the last 10 years, and that's because there's a voluntary scheme behind it. The industry got organized with the players, and every time you buy that Coke bottle, that water bottle, uh, you're paying a little bit of money for its recycling, and that's why it's starting to look so good. And I can say, happy 10th birthday, Petco. I believe they up in Joburg for a big bash tomorrow. So if anyone from Petco is here, Fantastic, but you're probably all gone. <laughs> Tires, right. So this is a different story. And you know, every time you and I have been getting into a car and the tires have been wearing down, we've had a free ride. There was nobody who paid for the recycling of those tires. And so they just ended up wherever. And it was a huge battle, it was a 20-year battle back, fight back, I think, by the entire industry, and maybe I'm, I'm a bit unfair here, to prevent government from regulating. But they couldn't self-regulate. And so there's a thing called the IIWTMP that's in the Government Gazette, and now every time you buy a tire, 2 Rand 30 per kilogram. I don't know, that's maybe another 100 Rand or 200 Rand. What's the value of your car, sir? <laughs> Right, he's driving a real small one, I know, but even for his real small one, um, 200 rand extra to make sure the recycling happens, I think, is a fair deal. That's all on recycling. Renewables, at scale and decentralized. So, one of the reasons why emissions have been going up, well, there are three reasons why carbon emissions 
continue to go up. The one is the population grows, the second is that we get richer, and the third one, which should work for, not against uh, emission reductions, is technology. So this graph is also from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, recent report, 2015, and it shows in the four bars the decades 70 to 80, 1980 to 1990, 90 to 2000, and 2001 to 2010. And it shows just by how much the emissions increased in each of those 10 years. The units are gigatons of CO2, so that's billions of tons of CO2. And in every decade they increased, but they increased fastest in the last decade. The, the different colors that we have there are what we can do about it. The blue is the population. We can't do much about it. You know, it's growing. The dark blue is how, by how much we're getting richer. And so you can see that in the 2000s, the years of bling, if you remember them, were real. People were spending everywhere. And so, you know, that drove emissions up tremendously. The orange below the line shows typically that as time goes by, engineers help society use energy more wisely, more efficiently. Energy efficiency is kind of a law, a law of the economy, and we make it happen because we look to save companies money. But energy efficiency is not a new thing that we can bring in to solve this problem. It's there by itself and always has been. The last one, the little red one that usually sits at the bottom, but then sat on the top, meaning it made the problem worse rather than making it better, is what we call how carbon intensive the energy is. That means, do we burn more coal or do we burn more gas? Because coal releases about twice the CO2 than gas for the same amount of electricity. Or do we use renewables, which release about a 20th of that of coal for the energy? And so in the 2000s, whilst we already knew that climate change was something that needed to be addressed, the, even that lever that engineers and their paymasters could work on was switched in the wrong direction. I think that, and that's the conclusion of a panel that our, a colleague of ours has also worked on, and he's in the audience, the director of our energy research center. But since 2000, I think things have turned around. It's kind of coincidental that you get a new president in the United States and emissions start to drop. It doesn't work like that. Um, this is much more um, a result of them finding shale gas, but also of them starting to use renewables quite strongly. And so if the second largest emitter has turned the corner and starting to show a decline, there may well be hope that we're starting to understand how to do that. And I would think there is some credit to be given to the current administration on that matter, but that's not quite my field. We also doing first steps in this. South Africa has been, uh, been lauded internationally for its renewables program. Here's a little photo somewhere in the Northern Cape. This is a fairly small one, 25 megawatt, um, and that's been running for almost a year. So yeah, things are starting to turn. Our own research in my group in the renewables has focused a lot on the question of biogas turning waste uh, or recovering waste from energy. On that photo, you see our green talent, Melissa, a few years ago at Leo Market Hall, experimenting with the food that some of our students leave on their plates. And that makes fire in the kitchen. Our interest in particular is to bring that back to the issues of sustainable development, to the needs of the poor. We've been doing research around food preparation in urban informal settings. And to our horror, we could confirm that some of the timber that is burnt there contains toxic heavy metals because that's not firewood. It was wood that was used for other parts of uh, other uses in society and became waste. Systems intelligence, very briefly. Okay. I use a tool called life cycle assessment. I, I, yeah. I mentioned my intuitive in induction to the field of life cycle thinking through my cousin and the uranium life cycle. So I use this tool quite properly. Um, it is recognized by the United Nations Environment Program who run a big global campaign and they've got well over 3,000 
knowledge, workers across the globe signed up to the life cycle network. This is now a fairly standard way of working up all the environmental impacts that a product may have across its whole life cycle um, and working up in different environmental indicators, not just what you know is the carbon footprint. This one is just to say, wow, we also do some science in my research group. This is a slide I made a few years ago um, that laid the foundation for probably my best known piece that I've written, uh, which is this one here. Um, I started working on this idea of reviewing whether biofuels are good or bad for the environment about the time that Myoin was born. And you can see if she's 12, took us about five years until it was finally published. You know, a good idea takes some time to get through. Um, and my co-author here was from the United States EPA, the Environment Protection Agency, who came out to UCT to spend a sabbatical with us. And uh, yeah, we, we helped people really make up their minds whether to use biofuels or not and under what conditions. And, and I thought, yeah, that's nice to know that we've had a bit of a contribution to a big global question. The question, in that piece we really said the science is not good enough, we can't answer it, but we think here are some answers. Um, that stimulated the field of life cycle assessment to be developed much further and a good answer was provided a few years later uh, by a real good team in California, which now say, no, there is a problem. And the problem looks like this. On the left is just good old fashioned petrol um, and on the right is um, uh, is ethanol that we can use. In fact, it's a blend of 85% ethanol and 15% petrol. And you can see the environmental impact, which are shown, the size of the bar, is actually in total higher for an ethanol fuel than for petrol. The first little contribution to that, the bottom one, is the carbon footprint. So indeed, a biofuel has a lower carbon footprint than an ethanol fuel. So, you know, so what we're seeing here, well, you need some systems intelligence. Uh, you can't just do a decision on a single indicator. By the way, the second bar, for those of you who are in the audience who do science, is a, a, an environmental impact called eutrophication. Essentially, it is all the unused fertilizer that washes down the Missouri and Mississippi rivers into the Gulf of Mexico and causes a lot of havoc environmentally down there. Engineering responses. So now I should be running into my last few minutes. So I'm double check that I'm not too far behind. Seven minutes. You can see I like to play a little bit with words. So firstly, the early engineering responses. It was a little bit disappointing that a lot of my engineering colleagues kind of seem to think that they are better scientists than the scientists. And for a young engineer to see senior engineers not act on something that science says is a problem, but to question the science was really something to swallow and to grow up with. Later, engineering response have said, this needs new technology. Sure, that's our game. We're here. Others say, look, we've got all the technology to solve the problem. You're underplaying technology. We might have the technology, but if the technology isn't being used, then the te technology is not attractive enough to you, the user. And so we need to work harder to make the technology attractive in terms of what it looks like, what it feels like, how safe it is, at what price it comes, etc. Right, so here's a real cool recent technological response. This is a solar-powered water wheel that picks up garbage in Baltimore Harbor. Right, so you know, addresses two of the glo global challenges there, um, but in a kind of after the fact way. And maybe we have to have an armada of these going over the Pacific Ocean to clean up. We are more interested in my research group whether we can gain some deeper insight or use our deeper insights to engineer some responses. For some of you, that might kind of almost smack like a term that was a bit disparaged some years ago, social engineering. Um, but, you know, engineering is the application of science for the benefit of humanity. And I really believe that engineers need to understand how things happen in business and society so that they can, if they are educated, make a contribution. 
And so this is a, a piece of work that a PhD student of mine uh, did with my guidance, where after understanding that there's something called an innovation system that is dormant needs to be kicked in around this problem of why South Africa doesn't use biogas, we specifically invited a very small number of people whom we think through their work would need to know each other to a workshop. And then we observed a year later what had come of the connections that were made. So we think that we have stimulated what is the current Industrial Biofuels Association to a little extent through what we did. The butterfly causing a tsunami. That's our hope, maybe not. My PhD student is in Utrecht this week presenting this work and I wish her luck. I spoke earlier about the engineer's hard, ta hard task, engineering responses, and this is another slide from my, for my fourth year class. Require judgment and they require ethics. And so we also study ethics in our fourth year class. I have arrived at the conclusion. So Ella, Maiwen, and, my, and your cousins, we're almost there. OK, right. I, I want to ask, what's the half-time score? You know, this is called an inaugural lecture, but you know, I've been at this for 15, 17 years. I've got another 20 or so to go. So in some ways, it feels like the half-time talk, all right? So how's Team Green doing? OK, um, it's not quite the 5-0 lead that we would hope for. Um, on recycling, I'd say we're about evens. Um, recycling made a lot of inroads. But there's also a lot of problems still to be addressed. On renewables, in 2010, it looked quite dismal. Um, but renewables have started to make a few hits. They need to score a lot more, but um, there's hope. Systems intelligence, we've certainly done the science and so on. Um, the challenge now is to take life cycle analysis, a very technical uh, term, out into society, into business, and that is led by the United Nations Environment Program uh, in a global campaign, in which we are proud to be a part of. But yeah, so some of us have been on the field for kind of 20 years. It's also happy birthday, 20th birthday. The year of our 20th democracy is also the 20th anniversary of the Chemical and Allied Industries Association and their responsible care, which started to look after the environment well before government started to put laws in place. And I'm particularly pleased that we got the chief executive of Kaya with us tonight. But fresh legs are going to be needed in the second half. So Team Green, go. It's, uh, it's those of you who are in our classes, all 450 of you and more. I want to make a few quick appeals to my colleagues in chemical engineering. This thing needs an interplay between systems understanding and going down to the fundamentals and finding better technology. But it also needs, I think, enough manpower on both sides. And I felt this year sometimes that I'm running about 20% above my capacity. So I'll try to do my bit. If you can do your bit, it would be great. The UCT executive, this is my chance to see them all here. Um, we first started to ask questions together with my colleague Harold about the Green Campus Action Plan and uh, possible carbon neutral campus that our Green Campus Initiative is is advocating for, and I think without renewables somewhere in our portfolio, we're not going to get there. So we've done really well. We've done really well on energy efficiency, but that is uh, one that just makes us money. We've got to now somehow go the next step and, and show South Africa that we can do some renewable energy in how this campus is powered. Ooh, um, do I have something to say for the president? <laughs> Yeah, you know, shale gas and nuclear energy are all things that relate to how this planet works. And I just want to say, we've got good laws. We've got good people in your government, Mr. President. We've got good procedures to make these very difficult decisions. So please use that skill in your government to make the difficult decisions wisely. And I'm not going to say much more than that. But we don't need ministerial decrees that, that come from nowhere or presidents starting to go off to other major powers to do power politics that will leave 
a nightmare that your government will be recalled for in centuries to come if you get it wrong. Go and play it safe and use the skills we have in this country. The next generation of engineers, you're the guys who have to take this on. I think that's all. Uh, I want to say thanks to all the people I've been able to learn from. Uh, most of these are postgrad students of mine. Many of you are in the audience. It's just fantastic. Your energy uh, and the way you think and your way you try to understand these difficult things. And I've learned a huge amount from you. And I, we didn't get all your photos, so there's a few more. Bottom left, bottom right, two global scholars. I haven't spoken about um, Donella Meadows in the bottom left, who really teaches us how systems work. And uh, I didn't, fit, didn't manage to fit her in, but she's a guru. Yay. Um, so, you know, scholars who care like Donella Meadows and the good research they do. You know, when they care, they do good research and they share it, and that's what good scholars do. Teachers, uh, I have to stop here. Um, you know, I, I asked the dean to speak about my very privileged schooling background. And at this point, I, I want to acknowledge my guest of honor tonight, Mr. Paul Balsen. Um, who's sitting in the second row. Yeah. He was a teacher in Sarkopmund at the German schools. He never taught me because politics intervened. He was too liberal. He was a UCT graduate. Didn't get on with the extreme right wing, I think, and got moved out. Um, but he taught others, and he, you know, he's, he's so... He doesn't look his age. I'm not going to say it. Um, but... Um, he taught a professor of biochemistry, Professor Brandt, who passed on recently. Paul's been a, on a raw vegan diet for over 50 years, and uh, he's your neighbor. He just lives down here in Lover's Walk. Go and meet him. An amazing man, uh, but he represents teachers, and we need good teachers to get good students into university, and that's one of our vice chancellor's big issues. My postgrads, all of you. My colleagues. Thanks. You're a great bunch. I'm not going to mention you individually, but particularly the one who sits next to me, who's made sure over the years that I rediscover and rediscover the joys of teaching and I don't just become a research professor. Thank you. Members of my family, there's about 20 of you tonight. This is amazing. So um, those are present. My brother and family have come from Namibia. My mother as well despite her somewhat fragile health. Leonard should have been here. He just can't be here. He's a sort of real good old fashioned German engineer, worked in the South African minerals industry, challenged me to be the precise engineer, and I, I've, I've just let him down on that front, I think. <laughs> Einstein, Einstein was right when he said it's, it's, it's better to be approximately right than to be precisely wrong. <laughs> Merci. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>